It's time to delve into the statistics that underlie entropy and its properties. And so I'll ask you to remember Boltzmann, who we talked about early in the course. And you recall Boltzmann's famous equation is S, entropy, is equal to Boltzmann's constant times the log of W, where W was some measure of disorder, possibility, probability. And so I'll also ask you to remember that we discussed ensembles, and in, we had a vision of a near-infinite water cooler filled with bottles, where the bottles were systems and the collection of bottles was called the ensemble. And I worked with that ensemble in particular, a particular flavor of ensemble, the NVT ensemble, which is called the canonical ensemble, that is where you are specifying a number, a volume, and a temperature. I want to work instead with a somewhat different ensemble now. Still a collection of bottles, that's the ensemble. Still each system is a bottle. But I'm actually going to control N, V, and E. Not the temperature, but rather the internal energy, E. I'm going to use E here instead of U. That is a microcanonical ensemble as opposed to a canonical ensemble. So the difference being that E is a state variable, not T. <coughs> now, even though every system has the same energy, that doesn't mean that they're all in the same state because there can be degeneracy. So there can be many states that have the same energy. We indicate that by this capital omega. So that is the degeneracy associated with a given energy. And in molecular systems and macroscopic volumes, that number is typically enormous, 10 to very large powers. And so I want to actually look at multinomial statistics. And so you may have heard of binomial statistics. Uh, we're actually going to be a little more general than that, but I'll, I'll make it clear here, hopefully, what I'm talking about. So let's take W, this number, to be the number of ways of having a certain number of systems in a given state, call it state 1. And so I'll indicate that by A subscript 1. The subscript tells you which state are you in. And another number of systems in state 2. So that's A sub 2. And so on. There could be a state 3, 4, however many I care about. And let's let the systems be distinguishable for a moment. So in that case, the number of ways I can do that, well, first off, how many ways can I order things? So if I am given a collection of things and the total number of things is capital A, how many ways can I put them in order? Well, of course, I have capital A choices for the first thing, and I have capital A minus 1 choices for the second thing. So that's A times A minus 1 for the first two, and then capital A minus 2 for the third thing, and so on. So the number of ways I can order them is A factorial. But I'm not interested in only how might I order them, but I'm going to put them into subclasses. That's what the little a's are, a sub 1 systems in a given state, a sub 2 systems in a second state. And I don't actually care about how they're ordered in their substates. All I cared about was that there was a certain number there. And so I end up dividing a factorial by the number of ways I can organize them in their substates, because I've overcounted those possibilities. They're all the same possibility as far as I'm concerned. So the number in each individual state, factorial, that's how many ways I could reorder those, appears in the denominator. And so I'll just write that more simply as a product over all the number of states I'm considering of the number of, uh, of systems in that state, factorial. And just to show an example, let's say that I have four total systems and hence capital A is 4. And I ask the question, well, how many ways can I arrange two of them in state 1 and two of them in state 2? And that uses up all my possibilities. That's four systems. So none in state 3 and none in state 4. And I'll just explicitly draw them. So here are four states. And I basically will just label them. This one's in 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, and so on. And if you exhaust all the possibilities and convince yourself, you see I've got six written here. And so let's just check that out for a moment. 4 factorial, that's 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is 24. And divided by 2 factorial is 2. So 24 divided by 2 times 2, 24 over 4, 6. 
great, this works. Okay, it had to work, that's what the statistics say. And if you think of some of the other possibilities, uh, a trivial one, of course, is how many ways are there to have all four states the same? Well, that's 4 factorial over 4 factorial. That is the minimum possible value for w. It's 1. And then if you think about what's likely to be the maximum possible value, it's where every state is unique. And so I can label these things in a lot of different ways. I no longer have anything in the denominator associated with ordering within groups because there's only one in every group. So that maximizes w at 4 factorial itself, 24. And I've just listed a couple of other possibilities here, and you can verify for yourself that uh, that's actually the case. So let's take a moment, and I'll, I'll let you do one example of your own, not one of these. And uh, once you're comfortable with that multinomial calculation, we'll move on. Great, that's not very hard, is it? So let's come back to Boltzmann's equation, s equals k log omega, uh, sorry, k log w. And in a perfectly ordered arrangement, w is equal to 1. And in that case, the entropy is equal to zero. And we did see on uh, a prior slide that in order to maximize W, the most disordered arrangement, that also clearly will give the maximum entropy. Now, as to why it's log of W and not just W itself, for instance, well, that comes from the additivity of the entropy but the product-like character of ways of arranging things. That is, I want the total entropy to be equal to entropy for one set of systems, call them capital A, and another set of systems, call them capital B. But the number of ways I can accomplish those arrangements is the product of all the ways I can do it over here, because for every number of ways I can do it over here, that's true for each one of the number of ways I can do it over here. So I have to multiply all these possibilities times these possibilities. And so what is the function for which k log this product is, uh, what, well, I guess I should say, what's the function? You need a log function to take the log of this product and turn that into a sum of logs. A log of products is a sum of logs. So it does have the correct behavior then that s total is equal to sa, this defines sa, plus sb. Now, I want to look at another way to express the entropy, and this is known as the degeneracy form. So let me take this expression, s equals k log w. I've just written w out with all its factorials. And now I've got a log of a quotient. So that's a log of differences. So it's log of the numerator minus log of the denominator. But the denominator is itself a product. And the log of a product is a sum of logarithms. So when I subtract, I won't subtract log of the product. I'll subtract sum of the logs. And what are those logs? The logs of each of the individual little aj factorial terms. So we need to deal with the log of a number factorial. And Sterling, a mathematician, worked out it's not too hard a to proof. You can give it a shot yourself if you're interested. Uh, that the log of n factorial, as n grows to a very large number, is extremely well approximated by n log n, no factorial, minus n. So once you know what n is, it's trivial to work out log of n factorial. And so if I use that approximation, what do I get here? So when I transform a factorial, log of a factorial, to n log n minus n, I'll get an a log a minus a. Similarly, each of these little aj factorials, I'll get an a log a, little a's, plus sum, because I'm having to do this for all these little a's, sum over all the j's, little a's. But what is the sum of all the little a's? It's capital A. That was the definition of capital A, the sum of all the little a's. And so those two terms drop out, and I'm left with this, Boltzmann's constant times this expression. So now, let's let the number of degenerate states, j, that are available to the system be represented by capital omega. So that's what I'm summing over here, all the degenerate states. And the population of each degenerate state is going to be equal to some number n. And they're all going to be the same number, because remember, that's when w is maximized, when all the states have the same population. And in that case, then, what is the total number of systems? 
Well, it's n times the degeneracy. So I'm gonna, just going to swap that in. Everywhere I had an a before, I'm going to put n times the degeneracy. And everywhere I had a little a, I've got an n. So here was a capital A, n times the degeneracy. Here it was again, minus, now my sum, I'll, I'll emphasize that the upper limit is the degeneracy, the capital omega, of n log n. And so I will uh, expand that out a bit. So this term is still here, and this is the same term, n's a constant. And I just add it to itself, capital omega times. So I've just multiplied times omega. It's omega times n log n, or n omega log n. So now I have this, and if I look at that and I expand it, I have n omega log, this is a product, so I'll get n omega log n plus n omega log omega minus n omega log n. That third term canceled the first term. I'm left only with n omega, Boltzmann's constant, log omega. Well, that's like omega to the n omega power, since I have this multiplier out here, that could be an exponent on the argument of the logarithm. And what is n omega? It is the total number in the, in the ensemble, capital A. So it's like log of omega for a system to the eighth power and what does that mean? The degeneracy of a system times all the systems in the ensemble, well, the product of all the degeneracies is the degeneracy of the ensemble. And so I've ended up transforming to entropy is k log degeneracy for the ensemble. This is another way to write entropy, which I accidentally sort of misspoke a little bit earlier in the video. So in addition to s equals k log w, you can say s equals k log omega. And let's actually consider a specific example maybe to, to hammer this point home. So imagine that I'm going to isothermally expand an ideal gas, and I'm interested in an entropy change. So what is the degeneracy available to that ideal gas? Well, it's going to be some function that depends on how many molecules I have. It's going to be some function that depends what is the energy of the ideal gas. And this is isothermal, so it's a constant energy as I do the expansion but it's G will depend on E. And then finally, as I make the volume bigger, every single one of the molecules is going to have an opportunity to explore more volume, and so there's a volume to the nth power term in the degeneracy. It's an I ideal gas, none of the molecules interact with each other, they're all getting to explore more volume, so product of all of these is the degeneracy. And that just emphasizes that's how many molecules I have. Okay, so in that case, I want to work out delta S, and let's use a molar quantity so that N is Avogadro's number. As I go from volume one to volume two, that's gonna be then K log degeneracy for the second, the final state, state two, minus K log the degeneracy for state one. And so I'll just write out those degeneracies, F of N, G of E, V2 to the Avogadro's number power, same thing in the denominator except V1. F of N will cancel because the number of particles didn't change. G of E will cancel because the energy didn't change. So I'm left with log V2 over V1 to Avogadro's number power. It's a log, I can take that power out front. Boltzmann's constant times Avogadro's number is R. I get R log V2 over V1. And so this just emphasizes that simplification came because there's no change in number and it's isothermal, so no change in energy. Notice that that entropy change, R log V2 over V1, that's exactly what we worked out from considering sort of the classical thermodynamic considerations of energy, heat, work transfer for the expansion of an ideal gas. I showed it to you here in the isothermal uh, path, but remember it doesn't matter what path we take. So this is a statistical way to come up with the same result. Okay, well, now that we've examined sort of the fundamental statistics, I want to come back to entropy in sort of real model systems. Maybe that's a contradiction in term, a real model system. But systems that chemists uh, think about changes in and are interested in 
computing entropy and entropy changes. So that'll come next.